Happy Tuesday, guys. Welcome back to another episode of Eat, Train, Prosper. Today's episode is part two of Brian and I's follow-up on our respective N1 practical recap. So if you haven't listened to part one yet, go back and listen to that. And then today we are going to follow up with everything we didn't cover in part one on today's part two episode. Brian, want to jump into it? Yeah, 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 totally. Um, I also want to say that uh, prior to part one, we had our December Q&A episode and I went back and re-listened to it and we actually talked a lot about N1 and CAS and a lot of that stuff on that episode too. So um, one thing I, I wanted to bring to light from that episode that we talked about was tibia angle in relation to foot platform on a back supported movement. So we're thinking about like a hack squat, a leg press, uh, or a pendulum squat or something along those lines, right? And one of the things that, that we were discussing on the last episode is I made reference to my uh, my hack press at home and how I created this amazing setup where I can use these heel wedges and put them super down low and put my feet close together and I'm getting this most ridiculous knee flexion. And then you kind of said this thing that... Um, it doesn't exactly matter how much knee flexion you get when your back is supported. Is that correct? It, that's the kind of takeaway I got from it, but I should have alluded on that episode that like, I think this is what Kaz told me, but I don't, I'm not like convicted because yeah. it's still kind of like, doesn't quite, I'm like in theory, but I'm like, does it, does it not? So I'm interested to hear your follow up here to, to, because maybe I just listened like a dumbass. No, no, for sure, for sure. So so I'm not 100% sure either, but I can use two pieces of information and I think that we can kind of intuit a, a result of this, right? So one thing for sure is that the pendulum is a little bit different than a hack because you're pushing away from it in an arc. Um. So, and I think your question that you referenced was about a guy on the pendulum, right? Specific to the pendulum, yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's one potential caveat. Um, and the reason that I think that that's important is because in the final day, we had the semi-programming lecture that he went about where he was talking about exercise selection. And did he have those like things where, you know, the top of the board had quads and the bottom had hams and then there was adductors on one side and glutes on the other. And like you would choose movements that would fit somewhere in the spectrum. Yes, we did it from a we did it with like chest, I think actually. Okay. But yeah, same exercise. Yeah, yeah. So we did it for for legs. Um, and so as we were going through these, a couple times he was like, "Is this going to be more quads than this one, or is this one more quads than that one, or whatever?" And so everyone would kind of be, or I mostly was the only one talking. I would give my opinion, then he'd be like, "Anyone else think Ryan's right?" You know, and like no one would raise their hand. So um, so he'd be like, "All right, we're going on the floor. We're going to test this." <laughs> I have a question for you. Yeah, yeah. Did you guys have to like, you know, at the, we would either do it at the beginning of each day or at the end of each day. Like you'd like, okay, you stand up, show me like the lengthened, you know, um, position of like the short head of the biceps or whatever. Yeah, did yeah, you guys yeah. do that? Yeah. Was it like incredibly just like overwhelming and did you just like, I fucked it up horribly every single time. Like when other people would go, <laughs> I would be able to find it and I'm like, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. And then for some reason, like when I was on the spot, my brain would just like shut off. Like the, the one I got on like uh, day two was like the, the most basic one. He was like, okay, like the, the medial – or sorry, the lateral head of the delt, you know, shortened, which is literally just like arms out at a Right, team. the top of the basic. lateral is in the scaphoid Yeah, plane. literally yeah, yeah. the most basic it is. And I'm like, okay, ladder, and I'm like doing some rear delt thing on the inside. And then he was like, no. And then I was like, oh, fuck. And then when I realized it, I was like, I am a moron. I literally got teed up the easiest one and fucked it up so bad. <laughs> yeah, there was a girl uh, who sat in front of me who would get like so nervous all the time that you would like see her almost like shaking in her chair because she was so, ner so nervous. And, uh, and she would just turn to me and be like, I'm not okay. You know? <laughs> 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 but uh but no i i so i fucked up all of them on the arm and delt day because a it was day one i didn't understand anything and i was i was doing the same thing like when he would be like like the one i got on that day that i really remember is he was like a uh, long head of the bicep lengthened and and so in my mind i'm like 
like, of course, in retrospect, that's in the bottom of an incline dumbbell curl, like, or an incline cable curl with your elbow in and externally rotated, right? Mm-hmm. That's the bottom of the length and position. Like, I knew that intuitively, but in my head, I'm like, okay, length and position, move my arm this way, blah, 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 you know? And like, and of course, ha, ah, you just in the moment, you know, you do get a little bit flustered, but um, I think I, I, I redeemed myself on the subsequent days. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. The arm one in the, in the, was hard the glute one was really hard too for me and kind of because yeah. i just don't care like i walk yeah. up a hill and i get a massive fucking <laughs> so it's like one of those things like a compartmentalize because i just yeah. I don't need to know as much as i need to know these other things gotcha yeah i think i did pretty i'm pretty i think what you need to know about the glutes is that the the max the mead and the min they kind of go out laterally right and um as long as you know that the glute max is going to be things where you're mostly in the sagittal plane. And then as you move out laterally, you go to the glute med and then the glute min. Like I'm not super concerned about whether I know the different regions of the glute max, you know, I'm kind of just like, it's the glute max, like I'll, it'll get trained. Um, so, so yeah, but anyway, talking about the, the pendulum and the tibia angle and all that stuff. Um, so, so a, the pendulum pushes back in an arc. So I think in that sense, it doesn't, fully matter about the the shin angle at the front side um because you are pushing forward against the platform which is quad bias in general um but as we were going through that programming chart and kind of being like is this more quad biased or is that more quad biased we went out to the floor and started testing stuff and Cass goes okay so if i put my feet here on a hack squat and a leg press he did both um and i go down you know it, it's it is for sure quad and, uh, you know, there's a little bit of glute or whatever. And then he was like, what if I do this? And I put my feet in a sissy position and he literally put his feet like as low as they could go on the leg press so that he had to roll into his toes at the, uh, at the fully lengthened position. And, uh, and he was like, that's obviously more quad. And so the only thing that would make that obviously more quad would be that it's changing the tibia angle and pushing it forward more over the toes because he moved his feet down and uh, and went onto his toes there. So I, I think that there is some relevance to shin angle to, to platform. Um, the other kind of thing that I should mention is that a couple times he said things like, it's not more quad, it's just less glute. And so he, and I, that wasn't in specific reference to the thing I'm talking about, but he said it enough times that when I think about that, that's one of the things that pops into my head of like, maybe like something like that is not in fact more quad. It's a just less glute, but therefore it makes it more quad biased because that was the drill that we were doing was that, you know, is it more quad biased or is it more glute biased? It makes it more quad biased, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's more quad. Um, so as a programming consideration that becomes like, okay, do I want to do like the sledgehammer version where I get the glutes and the quads together and I get just as much quad, but I also get a little bit of glute or, Maybe I don't want to train my glutes in the lengthened position today. Maybe I want to train them in the shortened position. So I'll do this sissy squat version of my hack press, but then I'll throw in like a glute bridge or a 45 hip extension or something like that. Yeah, that, I mean, those are, those are like the big, those are like the longstanding kind of takeaway things of understanding that difference. I moving, you know, kind of going back to, to that original question or what I brought up, you know, two episodes ago, is it. I think, and, and you alluded to this, I think the angle of the pendulum does change it because it's like the arcing motion. So it, you're going to achieve that anyway, but yes, in like a, a leg press, uh, a hack squat or something like that, you do want to achieve that shin angle because you're not using that arcing motion. Like, I mean, like 99% of machines aren't going to have that arcing motion. So <laughs> right, like exactly. That, that glute press and the pendulum are the only two that I can think of. There's also like yeah. a, like a swing hack thing I've seen as well, but very rare. Let's talk real quick just about that a miserable single leg glute machine because that was the worst thing I did the whole weekend was what Cass put me through on that thing. Um, like everyone talked about the leg day being so bad on Sunday, but that one set of single leg glute press on that pendulum glute thing was so essentially Cass thought that I chose a weight that was too light is, is the real result of the thing because uh, he pushed against me for five reps 
And then on the sixth, he tried to let me do it myself, but he had gassed me so hard from the first five that I could no longer get the sixth rep. So then he had to help me for five reps because he said, you're getting 10 no matter what. So, so literally like I'm sitting there on the sixth rep pushing and nothing's moving and I'm like, I need help. And then from there I had to do four more reps. So that for sure was just the most debilitating experience of my life. And I've had a number, I mean, not of my life, that's not true at all, but I've had a, I've had a number of people contact me and be like, dude, you're going past failure on everything for four straight days. Like, you know, what is the point of all of this? So, so I will ask you because I have my thoughts on it as well, but why do you think that, you know, because their, their, their programming philosophy is not to push you past failure all the time. Their programming philosophy is not to even, you know, usually it's, you know, a set to failure on each exercise, maybe something along those lines, very generally, but they're not using forced reps and partials all the time and stuff like that. So, so what do you think is kind of the idea behind the way that this is done at camp? Twofold part one. It is absolutely fantastic marketing material. Um, second part, I firmly believe a lot of people do not know what true failure really is. And especially in this day and age where like the evidence-based, you know, um, movement, I guess I could say, is becoming so prominent in like not going to failure, reps in reserve. Like people will stop at a, like a two RIR that's probably like a six RIR. And if we're using the effective reps, you know, um, model, you kind of wasted that set essentially. If, if your goal is hypertrophy and really to just help, you know, you see, Hey, this is what failure is type of thing. So that part, and I should have said three, cause I just thought of a third one. Another part that was, was really interesting is as much as you go there to learn how to move yourself, you go there to learn how to be a better coach. And part of that is like guiding someone towards that technical failure and making sure that you are spotting them appropriately, not just yanking the weight as they're close to failure, but giving them just half a percent of assistance when they only need half a percent. And then maybe that goes up to 1% just to help them, you know, still utilize as much as they really can. Like maybe that is like a, a true failure. And then you're giving them that just 1% they need to really get an incredible stimulus out of that you know, um, set. So I think, you know, there's, there's threefold, right? If to be completely honest, like if we went there and we were just doing like, you know, movement under light load and like practicing reps, like it, it doesn't have as much, it's, it's honestly not as fun for me. I, I'm really happy. I got to go there and swing for the fences with a, with a group of guys that I just met. And it was, it was fun. You know, it brought me back to like my high school football days in the weight room, just fucking slinging weight with friends and trying as hard as you possibly could. I definitely feel there is a, a large benefit to that just in terms of like a, a social aspect. Uh -huh. Yeah. The camaraderie side, this is true. I actually also like the point about the marketing. That's a pretty obvious one that wasn't like on the front of my brain. Um, but yeah, for sure. You see people dying on a hack squat with four straps and like so the, <laughs> the, the, the inner, uh, masochist inside of us is like, yes, yeah, sign me up for that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so my idea was kind of the more along the lines of like, people don't really know how to train hard. And, and I think that that really is kind of seen in the evidence-based crowd now where there are people are like, I trained a two RIR, but they're really at like six or something and have no idea. Um, so yeah, that's a super solid point. Um, so yeah, what do we have on the agenda today? So First, uh, the, the biggest part that we're going to talk about is mostly like, what is the impact of this experience in, or sorry, what is like the education and, and, and impact of this on our, our basically, you know, cumulative experience and how does that change going forward? Like, how is this, let's first talk about ourselves, Brian, like how is yeah. this experience going to change how you train yourself moving forward? Good question. And I went back uh, yesterday and reviewed the hypertrophy cycle that I kind of laid out, was it what, two or three episodes ago now, uh, that I was planning on implementing after I got done with the N1. And uh, honestly, I went through it and I changed out maybe three movements, but the general structure of the entire uh, cycle remained the same. Like I exchanged out, you know, uh, one type of row for a different type of row. Like I'm going to, I really want to do one of those one arm rows in the functional trainer that we talked about on the last episode. Um, 
So I wanted to put one of those in and I wanted to, I had a, just a clavicular press around in, but I wanted to put a costal press around in too, because it, I originally had a, a double arm costal uh, press, but it's just, it's not very loadable. Like at some point you reach a point where the weight just starts pulling you up or you have to compromise stability and positioning to, to get the weight into position. So doing them one arm, like was, I did those at N1 and, and they were fantastic. So I'm going to do the majority of my chest work with press rounds, which is actually funny because that was the, the point we made on the last episode was it's not like we're going to just start doing press rounds now. Um, but actually like that, uh, that is, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be doing a clavicular press around, a, uh, a costal press around, and then I'm going to be doing a uh i think a flat dumbbell press so that's, that's the exact thought that i had like to it to you like this is exactly how i'm going to structure mine <laughs> really mm-hmm. that's awesome yeah so i think i'm gonna i'm gonna do that um i changed out a row like i said i uh didn't change anything in the structure of my lower body work um even given that it's like a hamstring biased cycle um so to speak but the the thing that I did get the most that I think I'm going to be implementing over time is kind of some different ideas and ways that we discussed to bias the lengthened position. And this is a topic that you and I talk about constantly for six months, 12 months, maybe since we even started the podcast. Uh, we've, we've been talking about the importance of the lengthened position and then we've had all those studies come out and all that stuff. So I asked Cass a number of questions about this. Um... And I think that it would be kind of cool to talk to the listeners about some of the different ways that we can do that. So uh, what I have been doing for the last year plus has been to take a set of a short overload movement. So you can think of any type of row or pull down movement, a leg extension, leg curl type thing. I've been essentially taking those to concentric failure where I cannot complete a full rep anymore. And then I've been completing three to six partial reps where I'm trying to complete a full rep, but I'm unable to, right? And so this provides a certain amount of of tension into the lengthened position, which if you just stopped when you could no longer do the full rep, then you have all of that range on the other side of the movement that you're kind of just leaving less trained, so to speak. So I asked Cass about like, you know, what would be like some other ways that we could work to bias the length in position? Um, Because in my head, intuitively, it was like, is the length in position really getting taxed fully if you're only doing it lengthened because the short position is already too tired? Right. Because then you've kind of even tired out the length in position. Like, yes, you're exerting max effort. Um, but what I later realized is that this approach of doing the partials is more of like a metabolic impact on the muscle. So it's creating more metabolites in, into it, et cetera, right? There's another approach that I would call probably like the sledgehammer approach to really like mash the length in position. And so this is kind of like what many people might refer to as a reverse drop set. And for all of the years of my training, 25 years now, I have never in my life tried a reverse drop set. So essentially what this means is that you would take a short overloaded movement, we'll use a a row, and you'll go until a couple reps shy, a few reps shy, maybe two to four, two to four reps shy of being able to complete a full rep. So you're leaving yourself still like a little bit fresh um, with the short position. So you haven't completely taxed all the, the short position pieces. And then you increase the weight 25%. So let's assume you were rowing with 100 pounds. You would go to two to four reps shy of failure. You would increase your weight to 125 pounds and you would complete as many reps as you could pulling as far as you can. There would obviously have to be like a cutoff point. Like once I can no longer complete a quarter of a rep or a third of a rep or or whatever it is, you, you would you would cut the set. Um, But the idea is more or less that however many reps you got on the short position uh, where you stopped two to four reps shy of failure, you should get something similar as you're going through these heavier lengthened position reps. And um, that's something that I think is universally applicable across all short overload movements. I mean, I wouldn't program it for all of them at the same time. I think you're asking for a lot of damage and stuff like that. But I think that the idea, the concept could be applied to all of these movements. And uh, specifically as it relates to hamstrings and even more specifically to the hip extension machine or hip extension in general, um, this is a cool idea 
because it's always going to fail at the short position. And I asked in the past, you know, what would be the best way to bias the length in position? And the answer was just do the three quarters of the range of motion. Like don't actually do the shortened position at all. Or uh, he had another idea that was Actually, I'll go over the other ideas in a second. But basically, in the hip extension, that would work really well too because once again, it's a short overload movement where you can't essentially overload the length and position unless I do something like go like 50-pound dumbbells until I can't achieve short anymore or two to four reps shy. And then I can jump up to like the 75s or something like that and just do like the bottom range of motion. And I can just imagine how uh, how much stimulus that would be for the hamstrings in that position. Yeah, that's that is such a that is like such a perfect use case of that exercise for that that reverse drop set. That is really really cool. You were we were briefly uh, corresponding about that on Instagram, and I like understood it, you know, in, in theory. But I now I fully get it from how you just explained it here. Um, that's great, especially for things like rows or something like that, where yeah. you're never really training that overload to like a, a true you know failure because the shortened is always going to take so much of that that's yeah that's brilliant that's really really i think so too yeah Yeah, so he gave me a number of different ways that we can bias the length and position in short overload movements so i'll cover those real quick but that was the one that stood out to me as like the most profound and the one that i think is going to stick with me the most so uh other ways are, uh, like I said, avoiding the top of the range of motion from the beginning. I'm not a huge fan of that approach though. Like, I don't know. I'd rather do the reverse drop set than just like start by doing partial reps. Agreed. Um, and then, uh, he said another option is one and a quarter or one and a half reps. So you would do like a full hip extension and then you would do just a bottom portion rep and then a full hip extension and then just a bottom portion rep. Um, he also proposed the idea of pre-exhaust, which is something that I actually have written into my program currently, where on the hip extension day, I have it scheduled to go from uh, leg curl directly to hip extension. Um, so in that sense, I should get some some solid pre-fatigue. And then one of the kind of stipulations of pre-exhaust supersets was that the second movement has to be stable. So you wouldn't want to go from like a, a, a leg curl to an RDL, even though I've done that before, I think that that's probably a worse idea than going from the leg curl to the, um, to the hip extension, just because in the RDL, there's so many more ways to compensate. I mean, maybe the the better example of that is if you went from a leg extension to a back squat, like you could have all the best intentions in the world of like, I'm going to stay in my quads and make this like a really quad dominant squat. But, but once you do the leg extension and then you start squatting, your body's naturally just going to become more hip dominant because your quads are going to be roasted. Um, so I think, you know, it's still stabilization in the second exercise was one of the other, um, takeaways I got from kind of supersetting same muscle groups. And, uh, so if I'm going to use a less stable movement, I would do that first and then do the leg extension or the leg curl second, um, to a kind of achieve a similar effect, like a post exhaust sequence. Yeah, that is, that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. But that, uh, length and overload stuff, like how to bias that's, that is going to be a huge portion of just things that I experiment with in training. Like I'm definitely not even at a point where I'm going to program that for a client where I'm like, no, dude, we're going to totally do these like bottom length things heavier than your actual prior set. Like, no, I'm not going to program that until I have a chance to kind of experiment with it for a couple months. But, um, it's definitely like, like you kind of alluded to, or even said directly that, at this point in our training career, just having like new tools to play with is super cool because it really does get to the point where doing the same things and reading the same materials, like it kind of reaches a point, like I was even talking with McConey about this, where like last year we were saying that there's just no new information in training. Like how many new training studies come out or new training ideas or methodologies where you're like, wow, that really like could potentially be something that I'm interested in implementing into my training. Most of the stuff we've already been trying for 20 years. And so there isn't a lot of new novel stuff that we really want to implement. And this fits the bill of something that, you know, piques my interest and gets me really excited. I agree. And you, you just, you just, uh, um, spark something that I forgot. I had, I had asked Cass, especially with some of these things, like you said, we're talking with, with, with Dave McConey and so much of the evidence-based stuff. So something that we've talked about, you know, at length on this podcast before is the, the studies about shortened, uh, or started seated leg extensions versus like the prone lying leg extension. So I asked Cass about this and he gave me like a, as, as always, just a fantastic answer. And he was like, well, it depends. Like maybe, um, like let's say on a, on a day where you have a lot of, um, 
lengthened overload movements on your hamstrings, like let's say you're doing heavy RDLs or something like that, it can make sense to then do the prone lying leg curl because it's going to overload that shortened position so much more. And then maybe you have like a quad dominant um, leg day and you're not doing much other hamstring, it would be great to then use the seated leg curl. And like, it's just the context, right? And, and that's what's, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and bash, you know, research studies by any degree, but if they do not exist in the context of the exact application you want to use them for, there is some degree of limited applicability. And I think, again, it's it sounds really corny, but it's such a fantastic name for how Cass has branded his company as N1 because like every answer really is, is like, it depends, right? Like have people are like different situations have an N of one, depending on, you know, the context of the situation, how you might handle things is different depending upon that specific context. And I thought yeah. that was like brilliant. Right? No, that's really, that's really well said. Yeah. yeah. Um, he actually said the same thing to us you know, in the same context with the leg curl. And then uh, because I only have a seated leg curl, I was like, but if you only have one, which would you want, you know? And he was like seated leg curl. <laughs> okay. And I was interested. And it was, I, I know he said not like, Obviously, there's a they they still have a lot of equipment coming into their HQ, but yeah. I noticed there wasn't a seated leg curl. There was only the the lying one, um, and that could be literally just equipment availability and shit. They'll have a all seated one. Of, yeah, I that. figured that, but I just thought it was. That's what reminded me of it because there was only the lying, you know, yeah. when I was there. Yeah, but. yeah. No, I hadn't done a lying leg curl. The last time I did one was with you in mm-hmm. uh, in Austin. So so getting on that on that machine again there to do the cast set was was cool and i actually like i really do enjoy the lying leg curl i it, it's different for sure um it's almost easier like i think being that you're laying down like you're prone and you really only have to focus on one thing i mean not that you have to focus on multiple things because you're sitting but like <laughs> but but the leverage isn't as good in the seated leg curl you know like your your legs are extended so the moment arm is longer mm-hmm. um whereas because you more of your legs are extended in that one, whereas in the C, in the lying one, only your tibia is extended and your quads are are pressed. Anyways, mm-hmm. so for whatever reason, um, I, I enjoyed it. I could see myself doing more of those if I had the option. That and that's exactly what I did on, on my first leg day back. And and specifically, what I did was I set the movement up so that I would remove a lot of that gastroc at the uh-huh. at the first like fifteen, the first degree, 15 degrees, yeah. and I had like incredible hamstring contraction from it. Like nice. it's, it comes back to like knowing is really it can be like half the battle in a lot of these mm-hmm. things. Like because you know like 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 anyone, you're it's hard to not to to intentionally not use the momentum. And yep. when I just removed, you know, I set it instead of like completely. You know, hundred not that wouldn't be one hundred and eighty degrees. I kind of instead of being like fully open, I closed the chain a little bit so that I you know finished the movement when my knee was still somewhat uh-huh. bent and just the the hamstring you know stimulus I got out of it was so much more. Yep. I think I only did two sets and I was like, yeah. "Fuck, dude, I'm done. I'm moving on." <laughs> well, and like you're not even getting the stretch position, so theoretically you probably could do more sets. You just got like a little disrupted by all the metabolites or whatever. But I think over time you'll be able to do more of those that way. Yeah. Um, one of the other things kind of relevant to that, that, uh, that, that Cass kind of was big on in, he made me do this as well on one of the exercises is the idea of a mechanical drop set. So a great example of that would be like dumbbell fly till you can't do anymore. And then dumbbell fly press until you can't do anymore. And then dumbbell bench until you can't do anymore because essentially your, your mechanical advantage is increasing as your, as your arms move in. And so you can continue accruing reps or whatever. And so this is the leg curl idea is, is what sparked that in my brain because that was one of Cass's examples is he's like, what you could do is you could just do like more isolated leg curls where you uh, don't do the 15 degrees until failure and then you could start doing full reps where you ask the calf for help in the beginning and now you can get like three or five more reps by going a little bit more range of motion which is an interesting uh example of of more range of motion being easier than less range of motion because that's not always the case and another example of that and this is the one that he made me do is he made me fucking take cast glute bridges to failure and then right when i thought i was done he goes now do hip thrusts until you can't do anymore and so so i'm like doing this like super acute like small range of motion for the for the glute bridge right and then he's like hip thrust now and like 
the bottom position flies up and then you get to the top and it's like, you know, cause, cause like you're still like super fucked up in the short position, but now you have all this power coming from the lengthened position. Um, so that sort of thing can be applied to movements where it's relevant as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, one of the, the, something I just thought of is it's really interesting cause it takes, we're having this conversation, right? And we're taking something that's somewhat like, I don't know, I, I, the word that comes to mind is like brutish in nature and tr- like historically with like lifting weights and just, oh, you know, big guys, you know, somewhat dumb historically, we're just going to go lift weights. And now it's like, in order to get better at that, we need to become like intellectuals and understand like mechanics. <laughs> Philosophers. And and like, yeah. And like, yeah. oh, well, if I, I know if the, you know, the first 15 degrees of um, knee flexion is, is the gastroc. And if I remove that by starting the movement there, it can bias more hamstring. And then when I open it up, I can, you know, and it's just kind of funny where it's like, in order to get really, really good, you need to go back to the complete opposite of what probably drew yeah. you to this in the beginning and start thinking about it and understanding it more. Yeah. Just kind yeah, of funny. No. For sure. I love that. There was actually a, on one of the iron culture episodes, um, they had a, a culture historian on like a weightlifting culture historian. It was really interesting. And uh, and he was saying that, like, you know, the, the, the idea of the stereotypical meathead who isn't smart, there was actually a scientist in, like, the 40s or 50s that went out to test this because he was convinced that people that lifted weights were stupid. And so he started giving IQ tests to, to all the weightlifters, and the average aggregate of all of their scores was above average. And so he essentially spent the next, like, 20 years trying to disprove his prior bias. So, like, it's just so funny how, how that, that goes like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, what, do you, what else do you have as far as uh, anything for yourself, things that you want to implement? No. Okay. How about in, in programming of others? I know you don't do as much programming of others as I do, but do you think there's any kind of overriding conceptual pieces or specific pieces that, that kind of will influence your programming? Definitely, definitely. So in terms of, and I briefly alluded to this in the, in the previous episode, but like the the amount of shortened overload movements versus lengthened overload movements, yeah. specifically because like any programming that I'm going to write is going to be purely for the goal of hypertrophy. Um, if someone comes to me and they're like, Aaron, I want to get strong. Can you help me? I'm like, yeah, what, what we're going to do is I'm going to feed you and then kick, we're going to give someone else your, your training, right? I'm not <laughs> doing that. Like, what? like, it's just, it's not my wheelhouse. I don't want it to be my wheelhouse. We'd be doing you a disservice type of thing. Um, so with that, like I said, like just biasing more of the, the, the lengthened uh, overload stuff specifically for hypertrophy and then within certain contexts, right? If, if we are going to do like, um, like you just kind of talked about, like, let's say we have like a garage gym program we're going to write and someone only has 40 minutes. We're going to do some more of that like mechanical superset type stuff to really get as much out of, as we can out of that time and just create as much stimulus as possible. So just thinking about programming from a different angle instead of thinking like, you know, program specific come down to like, okay, what is the goal? Obviously our goal is always hypertrophy. Um, how much time do we have? What equipment do we have? This is how we achieve that within that. So that is where I'm definitely going to start. What about you? I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, I think the most prudent move is to probably start programming like a few of the uh, arcs of motion into people's training and um, not even... I don't think that there's a huge education piece where I need to like look over their shoulder and be like, no, you're not performing this correctly because I think ultimately that there is, there's different levels to the implementation of these movements. Right. And like, I think it was, it was one of, one of the guys that went to the seminar uh, prior had a post where he was like, it's not bullseye or bust. And I think that's a line from, uh, from Cass as well, where like the idea that you're, tr- that you're aware that you, the fact that you're aware that these things exist and the fact that your intent is to move in a better manner, um, a more biomechanically correct manner, these intents are going to begin to teach your body uh, to move properly. And then as a coach, I can kind of generally guide them into that. Um, But I have already been programming a bunch of nuance into my programs for advanced athletes 
Um, I think, you know, sprinkling in little doses of this is important. Um, exercise selection and exercise execution are going to be the main facets that I, that I focus on with the advanced people. And this course gave me the tools to be able to better analyze and manipulate people's setup and movement. So it's not something as specific as I'm going to change my programming style around these new things that I know, but more about how I can gradually move people to move better and be more aware of the impact of their movement. Um, so that's kind of like one overriding precedent on like more of a philosophical look at things. Um, as far as like specific pieces, um, so like I have an advanced guy right now that I'm giving partials to because that's what I'm comfortable programming. Now, if I try these reverse drop set things and they are effective, then I can strategically program them in for him. I mean, I probably won't give him a sledgehammer in week one of a cycle, but if we're in week five and we know we're going to deload the next week and we've been doing partials anyways, then maybe it's, you know, this week we're not going to do the partials. We're going to do one of these reverse drop sets and see how that goes as we head into deload week. Um, so I think the gradual implementation of these things is important. Um, also as a way of making sure that you can uh, take the data that you get and actually make sense of it. You know, if you just kind of gave him like all the things at once, then you're like, whoa, what actually had an impact here? You know, so I think one or two things at a time is important. Um, I think I picked up a lot of just general overriding ideas on how to implement specialization cycles for people. Um, some prior to this, given all the focus I put on myself in the hamstring cycle that I built, but then also the knowledge that I gained there and the different tools that are available to work with to pre to create specialization, um, like potentially, you know, biasing more lengthened movements on one day. And, you know, if, if recovery is an issue, then you recover four or five days. Maybe you do a day of short overload movements where there's less damage and being able to use the tools that you have at your disposal, or even like Cass said, you know, volume ramping, like I never thought to use volume ramping in a specialization cycle, but you take one muscle group and you increase the volume on it, but leave everything else the same. And then you can kind of easily determine where your where is your MRV, right? Where is, where is your maximum recoverable volume? How high can I push this muscle group before it just no longer recovers anymore? Um, so things like that. I think the thing I'm really struggling with is I get so many people now from my general programs that have written me and been like, hey, how much of this are you going to incorporate into like Paragon or into Evolve? They're like, this is really cool. Like, I want to do this too, you know, all this stuff. And the thing is that what I what I what I really believe is that it isn't important for my general programs. Like if you are on a general program, you may be an advanced athlete. Like there's nothing wrong with being on a general program and being an advanced athlete, but I can't be writing my general programs with assuming that everybody on that program is advanced or that everybody potentially even has the same tolerance to different like volumes and stimuli. So what I'm trying to do in creating my general programs is create a program that's the most likely to succeed for the most people. And as soon as I start incorporating a lot of this um, really nuanced and contextual stuff, I'm essentially going to have to make assumptions about my audience and be like, my audience can benefit from doing these pull arounds or these press arounds or, but they probably can't like, to be honest, like if I was a general person on my program, I would hate to have all of my back and chest work programmed with single arm stuff because it's not time efficient. It's a waste of time. You have to belong to a, a commercial gym, like all of these different facets, right? So, so these are tools and things that I've learned that I think more broadly apply to my training, which can then potentially be passed down to the training of my one-on-one -on -one clients. And if there are any broad spanning ideas from those two experiments that then I think could be relevant for the masses in general, then maybe small bits and pieces of that get sprinkled into general programs. But um, overall, I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of change in those programs. I don't think you could have explained that any better, to be completely Thank you. honest. That was very, very uh, well put. Cool. That's awesome. Well, I guess that leads pretty well into our uh, our final topic, which is really like, how much does this all matter? And it kind of like, 
it, my, my tone in talking about the general programs probably gives away my stance on it. Like, like I don't, I don't think it matters until you, it, it does matter. I mean, the last 2%, right? So, so I think even for the last 2%, it might not matter, but I think for the first 98% of your journey, it really doesn't matter. What do you think? I don't know. And yeah, that's, being, yeah, yeah. that's being completely honest. The few parts I do feel strongly where it can, and I think it will really matter, injury prevention. Yep, that was right. where I was going to go with that so, too. Yep. like just by understanding that, like, I mean, and, and this is coming from someone who's had, you know, an, an Achilles repaired, a patella repaired, like tendons reattached, just from doing things wrong and being young and dumb and just literally ego lifting and that sort of things and just getting caught into, you know, um, um, dogmatic things like, oh, if you're not a man, unless you like barbell back squat and type of things, and then doing that for six years, and you're like, why aren't my fucking legs growing? Well, Aaron, <laughs> you're, you don't squat well for your quads. And if you went to something, you know, you would learn that type of thing, but I just never did. So I think in those contexts, it can really matter. What is your goal, right? If your goal is hyper hypertrophy and you want a fat set of quads, and you have long femurs, you probably don't need to be doing a barbell back squat. That's a really good context of where, you know, might this matter? Is it going to, you know, if, 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 and when I transition to it becoming this, you know, much more important in my training, is that going to put another five pounds of muscle on me? I don't know. You know, I, I, I can't honestly give a definitive yes or no answer. I'm being honest and saying, I don't know. So Brian, what do you think? Yeah. So injury prevention was going to be the number one that I was going to talk about because that applies to everybody, I guess, including that first 98%. But I think that the problem with trying to use these methods with the first, call it 90%, because I think there, there probably would be value in the, the 90 to 100% range. But the, the problem with using the methods in the first 90% is that um, it's extremely time consuming and that person probably doesn't even have the investment into this yet to warrant um, that much nuance in their training when they could get up to 90% and probably remain injury free, sticking to basic compound movements that train multiple muscle groups, committing less time, all these different things. Um, when it does come to the injury prevention side of things, though, I mean, it makes a huge difference. Like, like every single set that we did at N one over the weekend, four days of training, seven sessions, probably a thousand sets overall. Now hundreds, hundreds of sets. Um, there was never a concern at all that I was going to get injured because I was putting myself in the right positions. And all of these sets were like past failure too. So they're like past failure sets, but because my body's in the right position and I'm not compensating, um, it, it does, it does make a huge difference. The fact that we're lining movements up with the muscle fiber and then using the scapula to work around, um, that's huge. Like it really, it really, really does make a difference. Like your first example from the prior episode about the lateral raise, just as, as simple as not going directly lateral because, oh shit, there's a bony process in your shoulder that stops your arm from going up. Like when you get to right here, now you're essentially just lifting your trap to, your, to create, you're doing scapular elevation to create more rise. Um, whereas if you just move into the scapular plane and now I have all of this range here and you can actually feel where the stopping point is because if I continue going higher, you can see my scapula does the same thing that it does if I'm out to the side and try to go higher. So you can you can use your body and your scapula to find the ranges of motion that feel good for you. And what's really cool about that is it's not that you're sacrificing results by training in a more comfortable manner. You're actually optimizing results because you're you're lining up with the muscle fibers with the joint structure, which is, oh my God, crazy, right? Like, like why should we not have to feel pain in our joints when we're working out? Um, and so even like my example of going through a seven week strength phase where I was back to doing barbell basic movements and putting my bodies in, in positions that are restricted. Like I almost never use a barbell anymore in my training because I don't like being in that forward pronated position. I'd much rather have my hands attached to something neutral and be able to move um, from that plane of motion. So 
Um, so I think in that sense, it, it does matter. And I think it increases longevity. I think that that becomes even more important as we get older. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that would be my thought. I, there's still like, like even, even me in, in these last 2%, like it, if you would have asked me a year ago, I probably would have said like, yeah, you know, once I'm done trying to make gains and I'm just going to maintenance, like I'm probably just going to, you know, go back to like the six basic movements and just do those. But now I don't, I don't feel that way because those movements don't feel good for me. Um, so when I want to go to maintenance now, I'm probably going to use even more cables than I use now. And to be honest, my training probably isn't going to change a lot from it is now. I'm just going to do less of it. Um, whereas in the past, I would have thought that I would have just gone back to these basic movements. And now I realize that those basic movements don't feel good for me and that there is a way that you can continue to build muscle or maintain muscle without putting your body through as much trauma. Yeah. So I think for me to try and wrap that up i how much does it really matter in the beginning maybe not so much aside from injury prevention which we both agreed upon as you further invest your time and energy and decide that this whole lifting weights thing is like something that you love you know and, and want to give more of yourself to i think that that matters will increase you know but in the beginning i think this would probably just overwhelm somebody to be completely yeah. honest and they wouldn't even know how to do the movements properly. Like they would be trying to figure out their body. Um, and I was that, figuring out my body at 33 years old at the practical <laughs> trying to figure out how to do the movements properly. <laughs> right, right, right. So imagine somebody that like has minimal weightlifting experience like one year in and it's like, you're going to do this like movement around your rib cage in the scapular plane. And they're like, oh, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, totally it. Yeah, it, 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 it matters, but the, the amount that it matters is dependent on the individual and where you are in your journey. Cool. Anything you want to add on this one before we wrap up, Brian? No, this is our last episode till the new year. So, um, you know, happy new year, everybody. And uh, thanks for being with us for the last 12 months. Yeah, I want to kind of add on. Um, yeah, this is this is coming up right about a year when we launched the podcast. I think I officially uploaded that first episode like the December 28th or 29th and it's been uh, an incredible year so just thank you to everyone who who listens who reaches out and tells us they like the show or you know two people last week told me in person that they listened to the show and they <laughs> liked it and that was super cool and I'm just so thankful for you know that that meeting you and I had a year a year ago mm -hmm. and we lifted some weights and we kind of talked about different podcasts and then so you know what? I'm going to send Brian an email with a little bit of a podcast outline, a little bit yeah. of a game plan and be like, hey, what are your thoughts? And I'm just so thankful that I did that. Thankful that yeah. you were like, hell yeah, that, let's do this. <laughs> and that it's been just a wild year. And I can't wait to, to jump into year two and continue to bring on newer guests and just share with everyone who mm -hmm. listens some of the you know, knowledge that Brian and I have gained over the course of our, our lifetime of lifting weight and really just hang out with you every Tuesday, dude. It's <laughs> I love it. So just thank you. Everyone. Yeah, thank for you, sure, man. Brian. No, I appreciate that you, uh, that you took the time to put that together and reach out. Cause it was really just kind of like a conceptual conversation. We're going for a walk and we're like, you know, what do you want to do next year in your business? Blah, blah. blah. And I was like, podcast. And you're like podcast. Yeah. I want to do a podcast too. And, and then you sent me that thing and it was like, oh shit, like it's, it's happening now. And, um, so I'm, I'm glad we get to hang out every Tuesday as well. Cool. So, all right, Brian, have a good Christmas, New Year, everyone we'll else talk. out there. What would you say? I said we'll talk. Yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> Later, guys.